we're going to talk about foreknowledge tonight, God's foreknowledge. The question we're going to ask is, what does God actually know? What does God know? And you might think, well, that's easy. He knows everything. But I think there's more to it than that. And I think it's exciting to get to the more to it parts. Um, and then we're going to answer some questions that skeptics sometimes ask, like, if God knows what I'm going to do, then how is it possible that I actually have free will? If God knows you're about to drink the coffee you're holding, do you really have a choice to not drink it? That's a good question. We're going to answer that. Um, we're going to deal with something called open theism, which is something you've probably likely never heard of. A lot of people haven't heard of, but it's the idea that God doesn't actually know the future, but God only guesses at the future. You know, he's like, he's like kind of working all things together for good, but he's sort of like juggling everything that's going on to try to bring out some good reaction. Now, this is actually a growing, more and more popular view in the world out there, this open theism view. Um, we're going to deal with that. And we're uh, going to continue our going through Romans verse by verse as, as we keep moving forward. But because we hit the, the topic of foreknowledge, predestination, and I, I thought, let's just pause and let's unpack these ideas. And then we'll keep going through Romans 8 into Romans 9 as we get to the end of those. So um, uh, first thing I want to do is just we'll read the passage we're in. So we're here in Romans chapter 8. And starting in verse 28. It says, and we know that God works all things together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so that, that's what's bringing us the topic of God's foreknowledge. It's, it's really a theological topic. And there's an issue here between Calvinism and Arminianism, or I should say maybe Calvinism and everybody else. And so, so the non-Calvinists. Um, I wouldn't consider myself an Arminianist, but I wouldn't consider myself a Calvinist, although a lot of the people who watch on YouTube probably think I am a Calvinist because we have a lot in common with Calvinists, actually, and our, our view of God's glory and sovereignty, our firm, you know, unembarrassed willingness to stand on the scriptures and just proclaim what it says. That is in common with Calvinists. I like a lot about Calvinists, but I don't always agree with everything that's said there. So we're going to get into that. But before we do, let me just say this. Here's my little caveat, my little disclaimer. The debate between Calvinism and Arminianism is a discussion between believers, not non-believers. And sometimes people will attack with these sort of, I don't know, I'll be honest, irritating ideas <laughs> that come out. Like, well, if Calvinism is true, then God is evil because he's making all these things happen. And then, and I'm thinking, so what if Calvinism is true? And then you stand before God, you're going to be like, God, you're evil. Are you going to try that? Does that sound smart to you? If you're wrong, you're blaspheming God when you say that. That seems like a pretty weird thing to say. But then on the flip side, you'll have a Calvinist. And I actually talked to Calvinist a couple days ago. Good, friendly conversation. But he said, if, if, uh, if, if Calvinism is not true, if, if non-Calvinists are right, then what you have is a weak God. A weak God because he wants people to be saved, but he just can't make it happen. And, they, and, and I just said, are you going to stand before God and tell him he's weak? <laughs> like, is that what you're going to do? And what this is, is that this is um, what I like to call uh, trotting out the ark. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament when the, um, when the children of Israel were fighting their enemies, the Philistines, and they thought, man, we're not winning against our enemies. Tell you what, let's get the ark out of the temple or out of the tabernacle. Let's bring it out onto the battlefield and let's go to war with the ark. In other words, we're going to make it so it's like, God, you have to give us victory because if we lose, we lose the ark. Well, they lost. And what some people do is they trot out the gospel. And they feel their, their theological position so important on this, whatever topic it is, say it's foreknowledge, Calvinism, whatever, that they're going to say that anyone who disagrees with them on the particulars of their theology is actually disagreeing on the gospel itself. That's why I start off by saying, we're brothers and sisters having a conversation here. It's not a question of uh, gospel issues. Now, when it comes to me and a Jehovah's Witness, that's a gospel issue. The Ark is involved here, so to speak. Me and Mormonism, that's a gospel issue. Even, if, even me and Catholicism, that's a gospel issue. If you don't think so, you have never read Catholic theology. <laughs> um, that's a gospel issue. But Calvinism, Arminianism, that is not a gospel issue. Uh, thank you, Lord. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, and what we want to do is we want to be able to look at the text and rather than starting with maybe a construct of theology, just say, what can I affirm about God's foreknowledge? 
what can I affirm about, say, predestination? We'll get there next week. And, and then just believe those things. That, that's the simplicity that I'm going to come from. I want to know, what can I affirm here? And then we will do Q&A at the end. So you might want to write those questions down because you might forget them as we're going. So first off, what does God know? What does God know? Well, we have a, a Christian theological position, which is fairly unanimous in Christianity, which is the idea that God is omniscient. He has all knowledge. Omni meaning all and science meaning knowledge. He's omniscient. He has omniscience. All knowledge. Uh, you could say God knows everything. Everything. And that, that would be fair. But we're going to consider some different aspects of God's knowledge. Different sides of the equation of, of what God knows based on scripture. So we're going to establish omniscience doing something we like to call systematic theology. Systematic theology, or what you might just think of as a topical Bible study. <laughs> that's, that's the fancy term for topical Bible study. We pick, pick a topic and we survey different passages of scripture and then pull together all these truths to get a full understanding. So, God knows everything first. I'm going to give you, I think it's about five things that God knows. The first one is God knows everything that happens in the universe. He knows everything that's actually happening right now. And uh, I'll give you several verses for this. Uh, Job 28, 24. Job 28, 24, it says, For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees under the whole heavens. God's aware of all that is going on everywhere in the earth, underneath the whole heavens. He sees it all. Job 31, 4, it says, Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? All my steps. The impl implication is not just vaguely aware, but he's more intimately aware of the details of what's going on in my life. Job 34, verses 21 and 22. Job 34, verses 21 and 22. It says, For his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. There's just, there's no way of escaping God's awareness. Now this, this, this type of knowledge could be somehow connected. This is just a could be. I'm not making my theology on this. Could be somehow connected to God's omnipresence. I mean, because if he's omnipresent, he's certainly aware of everything that's going on everywhere. Um, Proverbs 15.3, here's another verse for you. It says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So if you like that he's keeping watch on you, that's, good. that's a good sign in your life. If you're like, oh man, he sees me everywhere, then that means maybe you should get your heart right with the Lord. <laughs> uh, Matthew 10, 29 and 30, Matthew 10, 29 and 30, it says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Do you recognize the words of Jesus here? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. God's intimate, detailed knowledge of you, the number of hairs on your head. So I would say it's, it's fair to say, there's other verses we could go to, but it's fair to say God knows, number one, everything that happens in the universe. If a star goes supernova, God's aware of it before us, partially because of it takes time for light to travel across the universe to get to us. But he's aware of it as it happens. He knows all that is happening. Okay, so number two, second thing God knows. God knows our secret thoughts. Our secret thoughts. Or you could just say our thoughts, <laughs> because they're all kind of secret, right? Uh, First Chronicles 28.9. First Chronicles 28.9, it says... As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. He knows my heart and what's going on in, in my thought process, and he's even searching my motives, the intent, what I why I was thinking that or what my desire was there. So uh, Psalm uh, 44 verse 21b for he knows the secrets of the heart. God knows the secrets of your heart. This is, this is a great scripture for you to put up on your wall. Jeremiah 17, 9. It's about your heart. We like singing about our hearts, thinking about our hearts, writing love songs about your heart, and saying things like, God knows my heart. It's Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10 is for you, if that's you. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So you don't know your heart. That's the point. Your own heart tricks you. You know, you ever felt led of the Lord to do something that wasn't of the Lord? Well, you were being led of your heart. <laughs> and your heart was deceiving you, trying to find a motive, trying to find a good excuse to do the thing you felt like doing. Um, this, of course, is, is the cause of adultery. <laughs> and people saying, oh, well, the Lord's leading me to get divorced. And that, that sort of content a lot of times is coming from this. So the heart's deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Uh, this is consequently quoted wrong a lot of times within Calvary Chapels. I don't know how that started, but it did. 
we, we, we like to say the heart is deceitfully wicked. Think about that for a second. If it's deceitfully wicked, that means it's pretending to be wicked, but it's actually good. <laughs> it's like, I was being wicked, tricked you, I was good. Like that's not, it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Um, of course, it's the most deceitful because it deceives you from the inside out. I mean, I, just, I deceive myself with my own heart. I need the Lord. But then it talks about God's knowledge of your heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So not only does God have knowledge of your heart, the, he has more knowledge than you do of your own heart. God knows my heart is actually not saying, I know I'm good, and God does too. It's more like saying, God knows my heart, and I hope I'm doing all right. You know, because I don't, because my heart's deceitfully wicked. Not. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. Um, Hebrews 4.13 Maybe this, this sort of knowledge of God knowing our hearts, this will make more sense now, Hebrews 4.13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Naked and open. Nothing being hidden. You know, a lot of people's, the clothes that they wear is, is largely about hiding. This is a good thing, by the way. You should, there are clothes that are about not hiding. I, I think that that's... Just, you know, should be in the bedroom of a married couple and that's about it. But we are completely unhidden. There's nothing about me that's hidden. So God knows my secret thoughts. He can read my mind. He can read my mind. Um, this, you might be asking, like, can Satan read my mind too? Well, there's no scripture that I can think of that suggests that Satan can read the minds of men. Although we do have scripture that says that Satan put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. So the idea is that he could sort of uh, try to interject uh, an idea or desire into someone's heart, but there's nothing specifically saying he can read the mind of a person. But I do think this, that Satan, after all these years, has probably become a pretty good study of human character. I mean, like me as a youth pastor, I've become fairly good at reading teenagers after all these years. And just reading people in general, we all tend to get better and better at that as we go on in life. You can kind of read people. I imagine he's fairly good at it, and so, um, so, but, but who knows? But we know for sure God definitely can read minds completely and entirely, um, and motives. So number three, so first was that God knows what everything that happens in the universe. Two is that God knows our secret thoughts and motives. Three is that God knows the future. God knows the future. Psalm one thirty nine, verse sixteen, it says, "Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed." And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet, there were none of them. God's knowledge of the future. That was Psalm 139, verse 16. Also, Isaiah 41. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 through 24. Isaiah 41, 21 through 24, it says, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Now, here in Isaiah, God is challenging the false gods and the prophets of the false gods. Oh, if you're true gods, if you really are who you say you are, then come and tell us the future. It seems that this knowledge of the future is exclusive to God. It's exclusive to God. First Peter talks about how the, the things that were revealed to us are things that angels desired to look into. Like they were even waiting for the revelation of this gospel message. That only God knew all that was going to happen and reveals pieces of it to us. So again, uh, starting in verse 22 here, Isaiah 41. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Tell us what's going to happen next, is the idea. Or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Yes, do good or evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. The idea that false gods are exactly that. They're false. And one of the specific differences between false gods and true gods is this idea of prophecy. And there's only one true God and there's only one source of prophecy and that is God Almighty. That's why when we did our, uh, our series on evidence for the Bible, I spent 10 weeks on prophecy. Because prophecy is something unique to Christianity, unique to the Bible. I could say unique to Judaism. But Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. So here we are standing grafted in, you know. This is great because this is, this is God laying down the gavel. Let's, you want to test? Let's test. Let's do this prophecy thing. So God knows the future. And this, by the way, 
utterly and completely refutes the idea of open theism, doesn't it? That God doesn't know what's going to happen next. He knows. He knows all my days. He knows the things that are going to come next. He, in fact, challenges others. This is the, he's the only one that knows it. So open theism, or the idea that you have a God that's limited, you now what they do with this open theism thing is they think they're getting God off the hook for all the bad stuff that happens in the world. Right? Like, why is it that, that that person got a disease, or that person died, or that person got murdered? And it's like, well, God didn't know. Okay, well, that's, that's not biblical. That's the number one issue here, is that's just not biblical. Um, I do have a whole uh, video on YouTube, you guys are welcome to watch it, on the problem of evil. Um, I didn't teach it here Sunday night, I taught it uh, Sunday morning for the youth. And then, but I did put it online, so it's available there if you're interested. If this is a problem that's plaguing your heart, just, just Google my name and the phrase problem of evil. Or um, if God is good, why evil? Um, so there is that. But, but yeah, open theism is not where we need to go or can go if we're going to affirm what Scripture says. So number four, number four, God knows the what ifs. This is an interesting idea of God's knowledge. God knows what if. This is a really interesting concept. So l- let's, let's read. Well, first off, you know what a what if, right, is, right? Like, like if Randy stands up and screams right now, how will Mike respond? Well, God knows. I don't I actually know how to respond. I hope you don't do that. But <laughs> his wife's like, don't, please don't. Uh, but, but God knows what I would do under any set of circumstances. He knows what you would do under any set of circumstances. He knows that if, if this creature dies right here today, how that will check, uh, change the fertility of the soil for plants growing later on, which will affect when someone's walking through the field sometime 100 years later. Like the Lord knows every detail and every ramification of things. So this is uh, supported in scripture. Matthew eleven twenty one. Jesus speaking in Matthew eleven twenty one says, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Let me repeat the important part. For if, if, the what if, the mighty works which were done in you, as Jesus performed miracles, did things in those cities, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So if Jesus had had come earlier to a different group of cities, that, that city would have repented. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? You might be like, well, why didn't he come? Well, if he, he had to pick a time to come. <laughs> he, if he came then, he might be saying to Tyre and Sidon, hey, if I'd come at this other time, this other thing would have happened. But the, the Lord knows the what ifs, all of the what ifs. Ezekiel 3, Ezekiel 3, verses 4 through 6, another one of these um, what if things. It says, then he said to me, son of man, God speaking to Ezekiel, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. For you were not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech or of hard language, but to the house of Israel. So he's not going to Gentiles, he's going to Israel. But then, then this is interesting. Look at what he says. Um, not, verse 6, not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you to them, they would have listened to you. That's interesting, isn't it? If Ezekiel, the same prophet, had been sent to a different group of people, they, they would have listened to him. He was sent to Israel, and here they are, largely not listening. That's really interesting. So God knows the what ifs and seems to be making choices about how he'll handle reality, and he factors in all of these what ifs. Um, these are these are. Um, uh, these are kind of important, and actually right now, amongst, in, in the world of theology, in the world of, of people who are studying these sorts of things, this is actually, believe it or not, a really pivotal issue. And there's a fancy word for it, okay? So I'm going I'm to teach you guys the, the fancy philosophical term for God knowing the what ifs. It's called middle knowledge. Middle knowledge. Um, this is, I don't know, that middle knowledge is probably the easiest thing to remember. It's why it's correlated with the idea of what ifs. I could get into that some other time. But... It's an interesting concept. It's the idea that God knows if he had created the world slightly differently, exactly how things would have gone. Let's suppose that Winston Churchill was never born. Let's suppose that, um, that Thomas Edison had never existed. Let's suppose that Martin Luther died in, in, in the thunderstorm he was caught in when he was before he really became converted. God knows all those what ifs. He knows exactly what would happen, and He's chosen to allow things to happen, or and some in many cases cause specifically things to happen, exactly the way they have. 
this ends up being, this idea of God's middle knowledge is an interesting concept, and it's one way that some people try to reconcile the idea of free will and God's sovereignty. That God can, can, can still, knowing all the what-ifs, he kind of moves the, the chess pieces around, so to speak, of the world, still allowing us to have free will, still allowing us to make choices, because he knows every path that's going to be followed, and he's working in it, ends up, ends up bringing it to a perfect and set end. I think that that sounds like a very biblical idea to me. That God is both allowing us to have free will and still being sovereign in all things. Because he knew from the moment of creation and how he crafted and created every little thing, what would happen next. So God knows what ifs. Now, now nobody really, that I, nobody can have a good reason to, I think, reject the idea of middle knowledge, of God having what ifs. The question is, what does he do with that knowledge or you know, that's, that's the debate. How does it factor into free will? I think it's a good explanation of free will. But um, my opinion, I'll, I'll read one more verse for it. Ephesians 1.11. It says, in, in him, we also have obtained an inheritance being predestined. We'll get to there next week. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. God's not doing everything, but he's working all things according to the counsel of his will. He's not causing every event directly. He has other causes. You're a cause of events because you have will, free will to do things. But he's working all those decisions together to a purpose and an end. And, um, and so I think we have a marriage of sovereignty and free will where God's sovereignty stands atop free will, but free will still exists. So, number five. Number five. God cannot learn. God doesn't learn. He doesn't learn. Not because he's really old and you can't teach an old God new tricks. That's not why. <laughs> That's not it. Not at all. Not at all. He cannot learn because of the completion of his knowledge, because of the fullness of his knowledge. There's nothing to learn. There's nothing outside of that realm of his knowledge. So let me read to you some scriptures. Romans 11, 33 and 34. It says, Oh, the depths of the riches of both, uh, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? It's a rhetorical question. Are you, you going to give God counsel? You're going to tell him something he doesn't know? You're going to be able to inform him? Some people think they can, and I would say it's, it's evidence of a spiritual blindness in the heart to think that I can stand atop him and judge God um, or inform him. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14, it says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? There's a big, loud, rhetorical nobody attached to this idea. No one's teaching him these things. So to conclude, um, Psalm 147, verse 5, as far as God's foreknowledge or God's knowledge, what does God know? Um, Not just foreknowledge, but knowledge period. It says in Psalm 147, verse 5, Great is our Lord and mighty in power, his understanding is infinite. Now imagine this, comparing your mind to the mind of God. Like how little I know. How little I know. And how little I know about the circumstances that I'm in. And how the things that are going on in my life are affecting other things, whether it's on earth or in the heavenlies. How little I know. I like what Job said after he encountered God. He said, and let me, let me paraphrase. He said, man, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I am such a fool. Who am I to reply against you, God? I repent in dust and ashes. I thought I got it. I didn't get it. And it wasn't that God taught him. God asked him a bunch of rhetorical questions that Job couldn't answer. Job, were you there when I you know, created the world? It's, it's all these great rhetorical questions that, that enlighten Job to who, who he was. So it's one thing to ask God questions. That's good. God is our, our teacher, right? But it's bad to question God. That's, that's putting myself in a position where I'm the judge of God, which is just utter folly, utter folly. Um, so uh, some people will, will summarize omniscience this way. If you want to get like a, a, you could say God knows everything. But, but of course, whenever you're talking with someone who wants to really get to the nitty gritty of it, or an atheist or a teenager, you need to be more specific. <laughs> and put it this way, God knows every true proposition. You know, it's true that Steve is sitting right there right now. That's true. God knows that. It's true that Steve will be wherever he'll be later. God knows where he'll be. It's true that if Steve was given a hamburger, 
he would eat it or something like that, you know. Um, but or or would not, you know. And and God knows. So so this this kind of covers God's knowledge of. He obviously knows all things in the past because if he knows all things in the present and has always been present, he also knows all things in the past. He knows the future. He knows what would happen. He knows the, so- the thoughts and intents of the hearts. He knows all these things. So God knows every true proposition is one way to put it. Um, and that may not even exhaust all of his knowledge. There's another really weird, confusing philosophical thing we won't get into because in the end, um, it'll take me 20 minutes. So um, here's a question, though, some people ask. Think about this for a second. Here's what the skeptic might say, the atheist, um, or maybe even the someone else who thinks, Mike, you give God credit for knowing too much, which is like, it's hard to give God too much credit. But um, does God know what a square circle looks like? Does God know, does his knowledge include the knowledge of what a square circle looks like? Uh, would you guys, raise your hand if you would say, yes, God knows that. Raise your hand if you'd say, no, God doesn't know that. Just curious. Raise your hand if you're like, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. The majority don't know. This is what you call a trick question, right? This, this is kind of like when a teenager is arguing with their parent, and um, they're, they're just trying to be clever rather than true. <laughs> That's kind of the case. Sometimes that happens. Um, but everyone else is doing it. Like, that has anything to do with anything. Um, yeah. So this is what you call nonsense. It's just words put together in a way that doesn't make a real sentence. Doesn't make any sense. Because there's no such thing as a square circle. They're mutually exclusive objects. If it's a circle, it's not a square. If it's a square, it's not a circle. Does God know what a square circle looks like? I think I would answer the question, no. He does not know this. He also doesn't know what door, chair, Tuesday smells. Because it's just words strung together that don't make sense. But this is why it's hard to answer. Because your brain's like, wait, what? Square circle. What is this? I don't understand. I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe. Sure, God knows it. Why not? He knows that it doesn't exist is probably what, it, what he knows. Now, if God wants, he can change the definitions of square and circle. But then we're asking a different question, I think. Um, or he can maybe create a reality in which the law of non-contradiction doesn't exist. <laughs> Perhaps I don't. I don't know how that's possible. I don't think it is. But, uh, but, but this is nonsense. This is not an actual question. But there are people who will try to trump the idea of omniscience with a question like that, and they are trumping something. But it's just themselves. They're self-trumped. Um, here's another question people would ask: uh, If God knows what I will do, does this mean I have no choice? I mean, God knows with absolute certainty that later on today I'm going to be editing this video to put it up on the internet to be hounded for doing so. God knows this. So do I have a choice not to? Could I just choose not to? I mean, this is an interesting question. I think it's interesting. And this is, this is actually, this is not related to Calvinism exactly. Okay, this is not, I don't, this is not really a Calvinist position. This is a position called fatalism. Fatalism, the idea that there is no free will anywhere because if God knows all, free will is automatically impossible. It's a logical contradiction itself to have foreknowledge with free will. Um, let me explain it to you in a way that I've heard explained. I think this, this is a good way to put it. And it was uh, by Dr. Uh, William Lane Craig. And I think this is a, a very helpful explanation. So I hope that this makes sense. Um, there's a difference between... Um, something being logically prior and something being chronologically prior. Sorry, <laughs> it's just how it is. So if it's chronologically prior, that means God's foreknowledge chronologically, he knows it before I do it, correct? And then in another complicated sense, he knows it from eternity, which is not a, a, a time location, it's simply from eternity, from constant existence. So God knows it before I do it, but what he's knowing is not that's chronologically prior, but it's not logically before the thing I do. He knows it because I'm going to do it. So could I have free will? Here's how it would work. Let's say I get home and instead of editing and getting this video online, I decide I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I was at camp all week with teenagers and I just want to sleep. I'm just going to go home and watch The Flash with Allison and then go to sleep. Um, so let's suppose that that's our, our decision and we do that instead. Now. God will, will know that instead of the other thing. So if I choose to not edit, 
the Lord knew I would choose not to edit. And he knew it before I chose it, but he knew it because I chose it. Does that help at all? <laughs> so God's foreknowledge here is dependent on the choice I make. If I would choose something else, he would have known that. Uh, I was asked a while back, like, why should I pray if God knows I'm going to pray? And I answered the question kind of jokingly. I said, well, because if you don't pray, God knows you're not going to pray. <laughs> um, so, so his knowledge of what I'll do doesn't make me do it. It's dependent upon me doing it. Does that make me somehow in power over God? No, because he gave me the ability to choose this. He gave me the free will to choose it. He gave me the, the opportunity. So it's, he's still sovereign over all things. He could change the situations. He could just blow up the earth right now, and then I have no, <laughs> no choice. So he can trump these decisions I make, but he allows them, and they're genuine choices. God's foreknowledge does not equal fatalism. Um, if I choose differently, he would just know that instead. So before we do our, our Q&A, I want to talk a little bit about this. Is, um, that's God's knowledge altogether. Now we're going to talk about God's use, the term foreknowledge used in Romans. Because believe it or not, when it comes to the debate between Calvinism or non-Calvinism, you've got a, a battleground on the issue of foreknowledge. And then the Calvinist has a very special definition of foreknowledge, and the non-Calvinist, especially the Arminianist in particular, has a very special definition of foreknowledge, and they're not the same. They're really not the same. So let me explain. Uh, some people believe that foreknow, there's two options here uh, amongst the Calvinist, Arminianist camps, uh, means simply to know ahead of time. I simply know before. That's it. That, that fits the etymology or the, the, the pieces of the word itself. Um, it's actually supported in other Greeks work in other Greek works. The way you know prognosko, that's the Greek word. The way that word is used both both in, uh, in 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 not only the text itself in say Romans, but also in other places in in uh, not scripture, but in just Greek works, Koine Greek. We see that just means to know ahead of time. It just means to know ahead of time. In fact, here's an example. There's only about five uses of this word in the New Testament, but one of them is Acts 26 verse five. This is prognosko, same word as being used in Acts, uh, or in uh, Romans, in this passage in Romans. It says, They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Anybody know who's talking there? Paul, right? Paul the Apostle's like, you guys knew, you guys knew me. He's defending himself in this court situation. And he's saying, I was a Pharisee. They know I'm a faithful Jew. Well, he just literally means you knew ahead of time. You just, you knew me before this event. You already knew who I was. Um, it's just knowing ahead of time. Now, undoubtedly, this is true. Does God know things ahead of time? Well, I've showed you from scripture. He knows the future before it happens. Um, this is, though, where the Arminius will say, so when God foreknows the, the, the saved, whom he then predestines and who he calls and predestines and all this stuff, when he foreknows them, he simply looks through the corridors of time and he sees them responding in faith to the gospel message, so he sees their faith. What he foreknows is their faith. And that becomes, for reasons that become clear as you study these topics, it becomes important that the Arminianist gets faith into the thing God's foreknowing. To me, I would say this. I don't know what specifically God foreknows. It's just he, he foreknows you. So is he going to foreknow your faith? Yes. But he also foreknows everything about you. So it's just an all-encompassing foreknowledge. God knows all there is about you. Of course, your faith will be included in that, but it's not singled out. It could be a lot more other things. Um, that God is also foreknowing. Now, the Calvinist, their view, uh, they won't look at foreknow as foreknowing your faith. They'll look at foreknow as foreloved, or even some would say foreordained. Um, that foreknowledge means you're foreordained or foreloved. I'm going to take the more general approach that some Calvinists have. I think this is um, uh, John Piper would take this view. I think Sprawl would, R.C. Sprawl would take this view, probably John MacArthur, that God foreloved them. Now, here's the thing I want to say first. Calvinists need this to mean for love. To my understanding, to, you know, Calvinist theology will fall apart at certain points, being a very strict structural theology if it doesn't have certain pieces in place. And one of those is God can't choose you based on anything about you. Now, the scripture is clear. God doesn't choose you based upon your works or your good deeds. But the Calvinist needs it to be he can't even choose you based on your faith. He can't even respond to, to your faith in some sense at all. Um, so the Calvinist needs this to mean for loved or for, or for ordained. So God doesn't factor anything in, not even faith. Because sometimes Calvinists will view faith as though it's a work. 
If you've been with me in Romans, and we'll get there when we hit Romans 11 later, faith is not a work. The Bible is very clear on this. Faith is not considered a work. So I have a couple concerns about this. If foreknown means foreloved, or God sort of picked you ahead of time, it makes it a little hard to get the difference between foreknown and predestined. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. It's like, well, whom he whom he chose, he picked. <laughs> it's, it, it starts to be feeling like there's not a lot of difference between them. And it could also be construed by some to mean that, well, God foreknows everything, right? We, we know God knows all future events. Does that mean that God's chosen every future event? And then, then you're back to kind of a sense of fatalism, aren't you? And that's one branch of Calvinism would actually hold that view. I think Martin Luther held that view. So scripture, I think, shows that that's not the case. God allows some things he doesn't want to happen. There's things God doesn't, he knows what will happen, but he doesn't want them to happen, doesn't like them happening, but because of free will, he allows them to happen. Acts 7.51 is, is an example of this. Stephen's preaching, he's filled with the spirit, so we take his words to be a scripture, and it says here, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, talking to the particular Jews that were there with him, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so to you. They resist the Holy Spirit. That God is calling them and pulling them, want, desiring them to do something, and they're resisting it, and God's allowing that within his sovereignty, allowing free will. Romans 10.21, it says, But to Israel, he says, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So that God's reaching out to them, I want you to come to me, Israel. I want you to be obedient to me and yield to me. He's stretching out his hands. I mean, if you just take this at its plain face value, you're like, he's not ordaining that they rebel against him at that point. So there's some things that God is allowing that God does not like, but it's because of his overall plan that he's allowing these things. So the Calvinist uh, response would be, but Mike, and this is a good response, this is an intelligent response, we should think about it. They'll say in the Old Testament, the word no is used relationally. And it is, right? Adam knew Eve. And we, we don't think he just had knowledge of her. It's like Adam knew. <laughs> Eve, right? This is, and they had a kid. Okay, that's that kind of knowledge. We also read that God knew Abraham. He knew Abraham, and this is a relational knowledge. God knew Abraham. In fact, let me read it to you. Genesis 18, verse 19. It says, For I have known him, God says of Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. So God knew Abraham for a particular purpose. So there seems to be like a relational aspect to that knowledge of God and man. Amos 3, 2. He says about Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. He's saying, you're in a, you're in a relationship with me, Israel, so I'm going to deal with you as my, as my people. Not like you're some strangers. Well, he obviously God knew all nations of the earth and all people of all times, but he knew Israel in a relational sense. So it's true that in the Old Testament, the word no is sometimes used relationally, but it's also true that it's sometime, sometimes used as just knowing stuff. Lots and lots of times. I can come with more examples of it just being used as knowledge than it being used relationally. So it doesn't really prove too much in that point, um, unfortunately. So what I've heard when I was reading up on this stuff from the Calvinist side of things was that that word prognosco is always used in a relational sense. Except I read an example in Acts 26.5 where Paul said, you guys prognoscoed me. And you know, I was a Pharisee, and I lived this according to the strictest sect. And so and this is one of those cases where sometimes even theological works just make claims that aren't entirely true. And it's good to check them out. Good to check them out. That was Acts 26.5, by the way. This not, they didn't love Paul. It wasn't a relational love of Paul. It was just like, you knew me. I was a strict Pharisee. That's the implication. Um, in 2 Peter 3.17, here's another use of prognosco. Sometimes it's used of... of it could be relational, but sometimes it's not. Second Peter 3.17, it says, You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, prognosco, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. What they know beforehand in the Second Peter passage is that there's false teachers that are coming. Well, they're not in like a love relationship with these false teachers. They just know about it ahead of time. So prognosco can be used to just mean knowledge ahead of time. 
I, I don't think you can import no, the relational sense, into the word, at least not dogmatically. So I think that the, the Calvinist view is somewhat forced. Um, but I also think that the Arminianist position sometimes, were, well, what God foreknew was their faith. I think that might be a little forced too. So maybe we're safe in saying in Romans, what God foreknew was, I don't know, everything. He knew everything. And whom he foreknew, he also, and we'll get there, he predestined. So even if you foreknew their faith, we're not going to get away from this idea of God's predestination. So we're going to talk about these issues. Um, as we keep moving forward, uh, we're going to continue with predestination next time. And I should, I want to put this on the video and make sure it's on here because I know I'm going to get it in the comment section from, from, my, from my Calvinist friends, who I love, by the way. Much respect. Ar if more Arminianists would study like Calvinists do, that would be great. <laughs> but the... Um, uh, there is some statement that, but when, when in foreknowledge is, is in God, is used of God in the New Testament, it's an active verb. God foreknows active tense of the verb because you get a lot of information in verbs in Greek. So it's in the active sense. So that means that it's God actually picking. He's selecting because it's active. But when foreknow is used of people who aren't God, it's also in the active sense. It's always in the active sense. Every time it's used, it's in the active sense, even when it's just, you know, you, knew, you know ahead of time that there'll be false prophets, but they're not making the false prophets come by knowing so. So, um, so forgive me for sharing this with you if you're not part of the discussion. Now you are. <laughs> now you are. And this is one of those things that you might, you might want to come back to um, if the time comes when you are uh, discussing these things with someone who's, probably, who's maybe thought this out a lot. And they've sat under some Calvinist, really great godly guys like John MacArthur and these guys, R.C. Sproul, John Piper, who I love and respect and love their ministries and receive from them, but don't agree with them on their conclusions in some areas, which I think is okay. <laughs> so um, let's pray, and then I'll, I'll take any questions. Um, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your foreknowledge because it gives us a great sense of security. Um, there is nothing that is a surprise to you. There is nothing that happens that isn't part of your plan, even if you did not directly cause it according to your perfect will. You're working it together for good, as it says in Romans 8.28. We thank you, Lord, because your foreknowledge gives us incredible comfort. Incredible comfort. Lord, and it, it is personal. You foreknew us. Predestined us. Those who, who put faith in Christ, those who, who do turn to Jesus Christ, were, were foreknown by you in a special way. That's exciting. That's a blessing. Lord, we are so privileged beyond words. Beyond any conception of man, we're, we're just so privileged and so blessed that you would, you would come and, uh, and take those who are so lowly and raise us up so high. We're so grateful. We love you, God. We pray that you'd help us endure, help us have great faith in, in our trials and in our struggles. And when we don't know what's coming next, may we trust because you do, and you've already taken account for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We will pray.